1 John chapter 1, we're looking at verses 5 through 10 this morning. John is writing to various fellowships that he was connected with while he was ministering at Ephesus. Verses 1 through 4 speak of the manifestation or the revelation of the eternal Christ who was from the beginning. Verse 4 tells us one of the reasons that John is writing that our joy may be full. Could anyone use more joy today? Well, that's one of the reasons why John is writing this epistle. And joy, we discovered last week, is different than happiness, right? Happiness is connected with what happens to you. Joy supersedes your circumstances. We said that joy is an emotion of heaven that we get to partake of here on earth. That's pretty cool. It transcends our our afflictions and our trials and our difficulty. And so having fellowship with God is the source of joy. Fellowship with God is the source of joy. And John now goes into detail as to what fellowship with God looks like. There are three things that he presents to us. One, uh, to receive the message declared, to walk in the light and confess your sin. That's it. Receive the message that's declared, Walk in the light as God is in the light and confess your sin before the Lord. Be be honest. So it's pretty straightforward. Number one, receive the declared message. He says in verse five, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He's he's an apostle. He's a, a disciple. He's an ambassador for the kingdom of God. And this is good that what was declared to him He's making known to us. The gospel was declared. The truth is declared. He's writing about it. He's telling us. And what's that message? Verse 5, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That's a truth claim. That means that it's either true or false. Well, what did God say in Genesis? He said, let there be light, and light was. So John is at work with his gospel and with 1 John in defining, helping us define what God is, but based on what God has said about himself, because that's where we understand who God is from himself. God is light. God is spirit. We find in John 4, 24, the gospel. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And then God is true, 1 John 5, 20. And Jesus says, I am the truth, right? So let's talk about light. If, if John is saying God is light, it's not like God is like a light or consider God as a light. He says God is light. Well, what do we know about light? Well, light speaks of power, doesn't it? Light is very, very powerful. Our sun gives the earth about 10 to the 22nd joules of power per day. You think, what does that even mean, Pastor David? <laughs> well, let's just say that 10 to the 22nd is a big Big number. It's 10 with 22 zeros after it. You take 10 times 10 and you do that 22 times. It's just mind boggling how large it is. It's gargantuan. Okay, so that aside, you say, well, what's a jewel? What's a jewel? Well, here's the thing that I learned this week a jewel is the amount of energy that's completed when you have a 2.2 pound something and you move it about three feet, okay? About one kilogram, and you accelerate it, and you slow it down one meter. Any engineers in here? Am I close? Okay, that's about the work, work completed. So that's just one joule. It's also equivalent to uh, the work completed to power a one-watt bulb for one second. And you go, a one-watt bulb? Who has one-watt bulbs? We have them all over the place. With LEDs, you can have a one-watt bulb that produces 20 to 30 watts of power. So imagine lighting that up for one second. You know, some of those museums that you've been to where they have little things where you can do to generate electricity and the light bulb goes or something moves or whatever. If you had some kind of generator that was activated by moving 2.2 pounds, you know, a 2.2-pound lever, like, boom! So that's a joule, and then it would light up a one-watt bulb for one second. But we're talking about a lot of jewels, 
a lot of jewels. And to give you an idea of how many units or measurements of power this is, if, let's just say, since we're talking math, if you converted 10 to the 22nd into seconds, that's a lot of seconds, but then you said, okay, let's do minutes, let's do hours, you know, that, that, kind, of, that kind of thing, and you're like, that's still a lot of hours, and then how about years? You go all the way, all the way to the year. 10 to the 22 seconds would equal about 317 trillion years. That's how big that number is. And my friends, that's just the amount of energy that the earth receives from the sun on one day. The sun is emanating energy in all directions. So we're talking about a lot of power, all right? We're talking about a lot of power. And the light that comes to the earth, it heats the earth, it creates weather patterns. We're now able to uh, store uh, harness sun energy and then use it at a later time. You can <clears throat> focus the sun's energy through a magnifying glass to produce intense heat. Intense heat. You can cook with that. You can produce steam energy uh, that. You can burn things or disassemble things. Listen to this. You can even focus the sun through a powerful magnifying glass and you can cause the disassembly or the alignment of atomic particles as in with a magnet. So if you super focus the sun at a magnet, even if it's a really strong magnet, what happens at the atomic level is all those things that are in alignment that make a magnetic force, they start to just disassemble and go away. That's how powerful light is. And so light is powerful, but light also speaks of, of pace, doesn't it? Light is fast. Light is really fast, 186,000 miles per second or 700 million miles an hour. How fast is that? Beside really, 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 really fast, if you were going the speed of light, in one second you could go around the earth 7.5 times. That's really, really fast. Light speaks of physics, doesn't it? The, the intrigue of, of people who dive into these things. There are aspects of light that man is just coming to understand. There, there's a very, very famous experiment <clears throat> done by Thomas Young in the early 1800s called the double slit experiment. Have you guys heard about this? Well, there's a YouTube video uh, that explains this experiment called the double slit experiment with Dr. Quantum. It looks like this, and it, I like cartoons, but it, it, he explains it very, very well. And if you look it up, there's a 12-minute video that you should check out this afternoon. It's fun uh, to watch. But Thomas Young discovered that light under circumstances uh, works as a um, a waveform. It functions like waves in, in water, but it also functions and acts like particles. So we, we understand that sun has wavelengths, right, in the color spectrum and things like, like that, but there are also measurements of sun in particles, and we call them what? Photons. Photons. And so in Young's experiment, like acted in some circumstances like a wave, but then in other circumstances, it acted like a particle. And what's even more disturbing is when they tried to observe why the light, I don't know, decided to act differently under certain circumstances, when they tried to observe it, the light changed its characteristics again. So it's like the light knew it was being observed. So my friends, there are, there are things to light that the best scientists and, you know, light people, you know, in the world, they, they still are just, uh, they just don't even have any kind of grasp of, but I, I, would, I would just ask, check out this video, the double slit experiment, type in Dr. Quantum, it's the 12-minute video that's really, really good. What does it tell us? It tells us that we have a creator who's outside of our time domain, and that he's eternal, and that his ways are beyond our ways. There's, if, if we find out something about God, it's not because we worked really, really hard and we discovered it. It's because God decided to reveal something about himself to us. Well, once we learn that, we realize we're accountable to him. We're accountable to our creator. Light speaks of potency for life, doesn't it? 
Light initializes the life-giving process of photosynthesis. If there's no light, there's no life. Light speaks of purity. It's been said that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Isn't that true? I love that phrase, especially in these days in which we live. You can even purify water with sunlight. But we know that for many, many years that we've been using UV rays to purify and disinfect a a lot of different things. Ah, but light also speaks of a person. John here says that God is light. In the Gospel of John, Jesus calls himself light. We'll get to that in a second. 1 John 1, 7, John says, This man, John, came for a witness, speaking of John the Baptist, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So here's John calling Jesus the light. Here's John in 1 John 1, 5, saying God is light. Jesus says he's the light, John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In the book of Revelation, verse 23 of chapter 21, the city, the new Jerusalem, had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. That's pretty awesome. Light speaks of not just a person. It doesn't just speak of of God. It doesn't just speak of Jesus. And we see that Jesus is God in these passages fairly clearly. But it also speaks of the presence of God. The presence of God. In the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory of God was revealed to the people. This glory, we know, radiated from Moses' face when he came down from Mount Sinai so that he had to wear a veil. But the glory was present in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, and then later the temple. Uh, But this glory of God fueled the pillar of fire that came up from the tabernacle in the wilderness. And what that did was it reminded the people of God that he would lead them and that he would never leave them or forsake them. And so if you were in the camp of the children of Israel and you were uh, discouraged or maybe finding that this dangerous journey through the wilderness was getting to you or you woke up from a bad dream or some kind of fear, all you had to do was push back the flap of your tent and look towards the center where the tabernacle was to be able to witness that pillar of fire at night and realize, oh, God is still there. His presence is still among us. He's still uh, going to lead us and direct us. That's really powerful. So this message of God being light is declared, and John says, I'm just declaring the message that was declared to me. Good job, John. That's our job, too. As disciples, we're ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. We don't get to make things up. We're called to declare the message that has been declared to us. But what we see here is that God is not just light in description in the senses that we we looked at, but we see in this verse and passage that John is linking the term light with the moral purity of God, with his moral excellence. So darkness is the absence of light. With God, there is no lack of light, no hint of darkness. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You see how it's not just that God is light, but it's speaking of his moral character. And so here's John delivering this, this message to us. There's a proclamation. We're, on, uh, we're being notified here. In, in similar fashion, it reminded me of when Jesus was speaking with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And Jesus was the one whom the prophets foretold, the promised one, uh, the Messiah. But she didn't know that she was talking to the Messiah And as a Samaritan, she did have some understanding, and she says in John 4, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And the word tell in that passage is the same word translated declare in John 1, 5. 
Jesus would say to her in verse, 40, uh, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Wow. Jesus unequivocally is declaring himself to, the, to be the, the Messiah to this woman. So God is light, in him there is no darkness as, at all. It means what? It means God is perfect. There, there's nothing dark, meaning there's no lack of light. If you go into a dark room, a dark place, it means that there's a lack of light, right? It means with God there's no hidden faults. With, with our son, there are still inconsistencies. There are spots on the sun. It emits um, solar flares that can impact us sometimes in a negative way, even here on earth. But God is far more glorious and far more perfect and far more pure than our own sun in our solar system that we orbit around every single year. And so we're to receive this message that God is pure moral, just, right, and worthy of our praise. So what does John do in this passage? That said, he's going to contrast light and darkness. Walking in light means walking according to God and His Word. Walking in darkness means walking according to sin and the flesh and the ways of this world. We'll see not only a contrast with light and darkness, but you need to see And understand that we'll see a contrast between the things that we say and then the things that we do in our life. There's a a, a, there needs to be a connection between what we say and what we do. And he's going to talk about the contrast. If you say this but do that, and they don't connect and match, that's a problem. Take a look at verse six. He says, If we say we have fellowship with him, And walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. John answers this question Can a person live in sin and have fellowship with God? The answer is no, certainly not. Walking in darkness here in this passage doesn't necessarily even mean a misstep or uh, missing the mark while you're trying to hit it. It speaks to a pattern of life, a pattern of living. But if a person is walking in the light with God in whom there's no darkness, then your path will be light. It will be moral. It will be good, and you'll have fellowship with God. If a person claims to have fellowship with God or thinks they have fellowship with God, but they walk in darkness, they're actually lying about their relationship with God. Fellowship with Him is so important. And if we say we have fellowship with Him, but we walk in the darkness then we're lying about that relationship and we don't practice the truth. So sometimes people will ask the question, well, is the darkness walker saved? I don't know. (laughs) But what it says at the very least, their relationship with God is not right and they are living a lie. Are they saved? Well, I can say totally biblically correct, they do not have a right relationship with God at that moment, okay? Whether they're saved or not, that's up to God. But I can say to that person, if they're walking in darkness, but they say they are in relationship, fellowship with God, I can say, you don't have a right relationship with the Lord. I can say, not even, I mean, I'm just communicating what God's communicated. You need to get right with God. Notice that our walk is connected to our talk. This is the first in a series of John addressing our saying and doing, our walk and our talk must match. We, we read in, in Timothy regarding the doctrine that accords with godliness. We have right doctrine, but we need to have right living. And right doctrine should always translate into right living. Walking in the light means we're practicing the truth of God. And so first of all, there's this message that we're to receive. God is light, and God defines what a relationship with him looks like. The second thing we see is that we're to walk in the light. It's a command. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God, but then we also have fellowship with one another. If you have a right relationship with God, that sets the stage for you to have right relationships with other people. Walking in the light is a purity that is practical. It's a purity that's practical. It proves we have fellowship with God. It proves we have the proper foundation and basis for fellowshipping with others. John is linking right belief about God with our actions. Proper doctrine should always produce proper practice. That's something that we need to understand. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk this out, and we need the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But proper doctrine should always translate into proper practice. A relationship with God impacts and affects greatly our relationship with others. And, and the byproduct of walking uprightly and rightly with God in the light, it brings us into true fellowship with one another. The, the best relationships that humans can have is the brother-sister, mother-father, family of God relationships here on this earth. That if it's in Christ... If that relationship, is, if that connection, even as a husband and wife, if that's, if that's under the blood of Jesus, if that's empowered by the Spirit, that's the best relationship that humans can have when it's in the light of God. But here's a question. What does it mean in verse 7? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, what it doesn't mean is that the actual drops or molecules of his literal blood would cleanse us from sin, but his literal death in our place and the literal wrath of the Father that he suffered and endured on our behalf. What is John doing here? He's linking the sacrificial death of Jesus back to the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. And there... A worshiper would take an animal like a lamb to the priest at the temple to be sacrificed in their place. And this picture would be of an innocent lamb dying in the place of the guilty offender. And so it would be baking into the heart and soul and mind of, of God's people that sin has a cost. It's costly, it's bloody speaks to the detestable nature of our sin. It speaks to also the life given in place of a sinner. Even in the Old Testament, we find God saying, do not partake of the blood from animals because there is life in the blood. It's a big thing to God. We know from the Old Testament that the hyssop branch, kind of like a sage, brushy, stiff kind of plant, was used in the application of the blood to the corners of the altar, but in some situations, that would be actually used to apply the blood to the offerer, to the guilty party. And the carcass was burned, and Numbers 19, 18 talks about this hyssop being used to dip in the blood of the sacrifice and the altar would be anointed and the offer would be anointed with this blood and you've just sacrificed an animal and you're thinking, what a bloody ordeal. Uh, that's part of the picture of our sin, isn't it? It's disgusting. It's a type though. All of the Old Testament sacrifices were a type that looked forward to Jesus who was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So every single Old Testament sacrifice looked forward to the one and only final sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the world. And so this reference speaks to the blood of the sacrifice. A lot of times, new Christians or even non-Christians, when we talk about the blood of Jesus, they, they don't understand those concepts. They don't have that uh, furniture right in their mind. And so it's important to slow down and say, well, why... Why does the blood of Christ cleanse us from, from sin? It's the blood of Jesus, his once and for all sacrifice that cleanses us. And Jesus told us, too, that his blood was shed for us. Why? For the forgiveness of sin. That's why he died. He's our hero. He died in our place once and for all. That's why his blood is precious. 
It speaks, too, that he died bodily. He gave it all for you and me to be forgiven and have a relationship with him. I, I love this old hymn. One stanza goes like this. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Now, what cleanses us in verse 7? Does it mention baptism? No. Does it even mention communion, although we love communion? No. Uh, does it mention any other religious duties? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to say it like that. Uh, <laughs> does it mention any other religious activities? No. What cleanses us from sin? The blood of Christ, his sacrifice. That's the only way to deal with the sin problem, is the blood of Christ regarding his death. There is cleansing found in the blood of Christ. And then notice what sins are forgiven here in verse 7. Most sins, all sin. All sin is forgiven. The sins that we commit against others, the sins that we commit against God when no one is around. The blood of Christ is so powerful, it can cleanse the vilest of sinners and even the most secret of sins. No sin is so secret that it's beyond God's forgiveness. And so next, the question might be, well, I'm a sinner, so how do I appropriate that? How, how do I receive forgiveness? Well, John will get to that specifically, but take a look at verse 8. He deals with this sin problem, first of all. He says, if we, have, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John, using we and us and ourselves in this passage, he's, he's including himself in this. He's saying, I'm a sinner and I have need of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, just like you. But we deceive ourselves if we say that we have no sin. We lie to ourselves when we try to hide our sin. We have a sin problem. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, there are people who will profess Christ and a relationship with God and then live in sin and, and try to convince themselves that everything is right between them and God. Well, are they a Christian or not? I don't know. But at the very least, they're not right with God. They're not in a right relationship with God, biblically and according to the truth. And any time we try to hide our sin, it means we're not walking in the light as he is in the light. It, we go back to our ancestors, Adam and Eve. They, they were responsible for the first cover-up, right? They tried to cover their sin. David, King David was well aware of his sin problem, specifically with his sin with Bathsheba, but he tried to hide it. He tried to cover it up. He lusted after Bathsheba. He committed adultery, and instead of being open and honest, he tried to just cover it up and, 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 and push it away. He tried to deceive Bathsheba's husband. He made him get drunk and then had him killed and lied to himself, lied to others, carried on his royal duties just like nothing ever happened. And then it ended up being David's chaplain. <laughs> Nathan the prophet came to David, and God used Nathan powerfully to expose his sin. And so the king was busted. David sinned greatly. And at that point, instead of trying to cover it up, he turned to God, he confessed his sin, and he repented. Oh, there were consequences, but he found forgiveness at the foot of the cross, prophetically. <laughs> Psalm 143, verses 1 and 2 Here's what he says. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness, answer me. And in your righteousness, do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight, no one living is righteous. It's like a sister verse to Romans 3.23, isn't it? There, there's no one righteous. All have sinned. There's none righteous. No, not one. And at this point, turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. David, even under the old covenant, went to the Lord for mercy and forgiveness. This is one of the penitential psalms. It speaks of repentance and remorse and contrition. There are seven of them. 
And no, these are not Powerball numbers, but 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143 that we just referenced, okay? These are uh, the penitential psalms. If you're sorry and repentant over your sin for sinning against God and you don't know how to pray or how to respond to God, go to these psalms. These are amazing psalms. Psalm 51 was written shortly after Nathan came to David and revealed his sin. This is, these words come from the darkest moments in David's self-awareness. And, and, and they're powerful. And he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledged my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born in sin and in sin my mother conceived me. And behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you, shall, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Wow. Turn with me to the left, please, to Psalm 32. It's believed that Psalm 32 is the answer to Psalm 51. David promised in Psalm 51, verse 13, that he would teach transgressors the ways of God. And, and Psalm 32 may very well be the fulfillment of that. G. Campbell War Morgan said, this is a psalm of penitence, but it's also the song of a ransomed soul rejoicing in the wonders of the grace of God. Sin is dealt with, sorrow is comforted, ignorance is instructed. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Just a couple things. In the first two verses, David uses three different terms to describe sin. Transgression, which means crossing a line or defying authority, where God says, here's the line, don't cross it. And you look around and you do one of these. Just like a three-year-old. <laughs> don't touch, don't do, and then they're going to touch and they're going to do. Sin means falling short or missing the mark even if you're trying to hit it. Iniquity speaks of the crookedness and distortion. But I, I, I tell you, for every one of these words for sin, David has a word for forgiveness. Forgiven speaks to the lifting of a burden or debt. The word covered is relating to the sacrificial blood in covering sin and making David uh, ceremonially clean before God. And then he says this phrase, does not impute. Does not impute. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute or put to the account. It's an accounting term that God doesn't put iniquity in our account. It's, it's glorious. For when I kept silent, verse 3, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. Pause there. 
I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Notice this. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Pause. Just think about that. My friends, this verse in Psalm 32, verse 5, is a beautiful sister companion verse, cross-reference verse, to 1 John 1, 9 that we're going to get to. If you like to write in your Bibles, I would write in the margin or just underneath it, 1 John 1, 9. And then when we get back to 1 John 1, 9, then you write Psalm 32, verse 5. It's a remarkable psalm. Uh, this, James Boyce remarked that this was St. Augustine's favorite psalm and that he had it inscribed on the wall next to his bed before he died in order to meditate on it better. We'll turn back to 1 John. We receive the message. We walk in the light. But then we're also number three, to confess our sin. We, we just heard David cry out, I was honest with you. I, I didn't hide my sin. I was open before you, Lord. And coming off of verse 8, that if we say we have no sin, there's no truth in us and we're actually walking in deception. He says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love this verse. Sometimes it's called the Christian's bar of soap that we reference often. But the word confess is very, very important because it doesn't mean just to say. It means to say the same thing as. It means to call sin, sin before God. It, it, it means that we're saying the same thing about our iniquity that God says about our iniquity. It means that we're to be specific and so we like to soften our sin, don't we? Well, when we're talking to someone else, I had a little bit of a misstep. A misstep? You wrecked your car and you got put in jail. You got that a misstep? Or whatever, right? Oh, it was just a moment of indiscretion. Are you kidding me? You destroyed your family. So we're to be honest. We're to say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin, not, oh, Lord, forgive me for all the bad things that I've ever done in my life. No, it means to say, Lord, please forgive me from stealing from my boss, whether it was a paperclip or whether it was time. Lord, forgive me for coveting, coveting my neighbor's house or cheating on my schoolwork or my evil thoughts or maybe all of them. <laughs> But it means to be specific. This verse is here, by the way, for us. It's for Christians. And God says, if you're honest with me, if you confess your sins, then God is faithful to forgive us like he said. And he's a faithful judge because, and a just judge because he can forgive us on the basis that Jesus paid the penalty. So he's faithful and he's just, he can do that, and we can find forgiveness. Uh, speaking of being specific, you know, us humans, we like to f make excuses, don't we? That's exactly what our ancestors did in the garden. The, the cover-up, excuses, the whole bit. The, Genesis, especially Genesis 1 through, through 11, so instructive, so instructive. But they made excuses. It was the woman you gave me. Uh, it was the serpent, you know, and we make excuses. And Corey Ten Boom said this. You're going to love this. She said, the blood of Jesus never cleansed an excuse. The blood of Jesus cleanses sin. And I'll say this, too. This verse, what we call the Christian bar of soap, it should never lead us into sin. Are you guys with me? No one should ever say, hey, I learned about this verse. I can go out and commit whatever sin I want, and I can come back and apply this verse to my life because God will forgive me. No, a thousand times no to the 10 to the 22nd power. <laughs> That's not what this means. This verse should not lead us into sin. God's grace is not a license to sin, but God's grace and forgiveness is, is to lead us in freedom, in freedom from sin to say no to sin because sin 
it's costly for it to be forgiven. For us to find this verse in our Bibles, it cost God his son. Forgiveness is not cheap. And I'll tell you, even when we fail, even when we sin or even uh, transgress or it's a high-handed sin in the face of God and we repent and we find ourselves confessing our sin and we're looking for forgiveness and God gives it to us, my friends, there are still sometimes really heavy ramifications of sin, consequences of sin. Oh, yes, God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Oh, yes, God can do amazing things. But you know what? That doesn't mean that all the consequences are going to go away. And God will use our consequences for discipleship. Praise God. But how many consequences of sin can you afford? Well, Pastor David experiences such a great teacher. Yeah, if you can afford the tuition. <laughs> okay? You know that phrase, your body's writing checks, or you're writing checks that your body can't cash. That's the trouble that we get ourselves into. Here's what David Guzik said. There is no more sure evidence that a person is out of fellowship with God than for someone to contemplate or commit sin with the idea, I can just ask for forgiveness later. Since God is light and in him is no darkness at all, we can be assured that the person who commits sin with this idea is not in fellowship with God. Well, if someone commits sin with this idea in mind, are they saved? I don't know. <laughs> but I can say biblically that they're not in fellowship with God. I love this verse. Don't forget to write down Psalm 32, 5 next to this verse. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make God a liar, and his word is not in us. This is horrific. If we say that we haven't sinned or we try to justify our sin, we make God out to be a liar. Any person in this condition does not have God's word dwelling in them. That means that God's word is not a priority, that they don't have a high view of scripture no matter what they say. They're telling God that he has lied about their sin condition. Can you imagine that? This is a despicable process that God has really laid out for us in this passage. When claiming fellowship with God and then walking in darkness, here's what happens. In verse 6, we first lie to other people. Then in verse 8, we're, we're deceived ourselves. We've lied to ourselves enough. We're now we're self-deceived. And it brings us to a place in verse 10 where now we're calling the God of the universe a liar. God protect us from this, from this path. Well, then the final stage, it gets worse. <laughs> the final stage is found in the next chapter. Look down uh, quickly to verse 4 of chapter 2. He who says, I know him, I know God, I have a relationship with God, I'm in fellowship with God, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And so if we claim to know the Lord, but we do not keep his commandments and apply his word to our lives, then guess what? Like this picture says, we are a confirmed liar. There is, there is no truth in us. It doesn't matter how nice we look. It doesn't matter how cute we are. Well, they just got married, and aren't they sweet? Oh, this man is so well-spoken. Oh, she, she's able to articulate herself so well. doesn't matter. You claim fellowship with God, but you walk in darkness, and you disobey God's word, and that's your life. And the Bible says, God says, you are a confirmed liar, and there's no truth in you. But notice... The contrast. Since we're dealing with contrasts this morning, look at verse 5 of chapter 2, and here's where we end. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected or completed in him. By this we know we are in him. What does that mean? That means if you have a desire to obey the Lord and learn his word and walk out his word, 
That, that evidence of a relationship is being lived out in your life. There's an inward and outward evidence that you're in Christ and Christ is in you. There's proof. There's proof that you're actually one of God's kids. There's a confirmation that you're really saved. If you say, Lord, you've saved me. I want to know what you have to say about me and my life and what you want to do with my life and how I can honor you for so great a salvation. Lord, you've saved me from death. What should I do now in light of salvation? If you have that heart and then you desire to walk out his commandments in the power of the Holy Spirit, then, then that's proof that you're actually one of God's kids. Well, what if I don't want to have anything to do with this Bible situation where there's all these rules and regulations and requirements? Well, that would probably prove that you're not in fellowship with God and you're not one of God's kids. I love that you and I can actually have a knowledge that we're truly saved because it's by grace that we're saved, but also it's the fruit of our lives. You desire to learn the word or you wouldn't be here. You desire to obey the word of God in your life and you say, Lord, I want to live uprightly and in integrity in my relationships with my spouse, with my family, uh, with my extended family, even though it's hard, <laughs> in school and, and, and at work. And that's, that's a saying that you are a part of the family of God. Spurgeon said this, the lesson from the whole is this. Be honest. Sinner, may God make you honest. Do not deceive yourself. Make a clean breast of it before the Lord. Have an honest religion or have none at all. Have a religion of the heart or else have none. Put aside the mere vestment and garment of piety and let your soul be right within. Be honest. Be honest. We know from chapter 5 that one of the reasons John wrote this epistle was that we would know that we have a relationship with Christ and we would know that we have eternal life and that we would continue to believe on the name of Jesus. And so, simple three-point message this morning. Receive the message that's been declared. Walk in the light as God is in the light. And confess your sin before the Lord. Be, be honest. Be honest. These are essentials to having a right relationship with God. And then the fruit is having right relationships with other people. Dear Jesus, we thank you for these things. Some of them are difficult to hear, Lord. Some of them are difficult to teach. But Lord, this is your word. This is your truth. And we're thankful, God, that you teach us how to respond to you. You, you teach us not just how to be saved, but Lord, you teach us how to live as saved people. Lord, help us to receive this message this morning. Help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. Help us to walk in purity and in uprightness according to your word for your glory. And Lord, when we mess up, when we stumble, when we sin, even if it's great, Lord, help us to be honest with our sin and confess it before you. And there, like King David did so long ago, to be able to find forgiveness and mercy. Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you for these things. In your name we pray. Amen.